Hi, I'm James Brooks, and welcome to From the Factory Floor, a conversational podcast about all things startup and tech, brought to you by the folks at thestartupfactory.tech. And welcome to another episode of From the Factory Floor, as ever, joined by Ian, who I just seems can't get rid of these days. And Nairi's back is again. Hi, guys. Hi, that's a bit of a backhanded compliment from you there, James, I think. And uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll show you what we can do to sustain my presence. Well, it's, it's the usual type of compliment I give. I don't think I do any that aren't backhanded these days. But obviously, we've got you both on today again, because um, obviously we did the KPIs last time. And one of the things that we've spoken about quite a lot at TSF um, quite recently as well is the nature of a lot of the startups that come to us are is the split between the solo founders and those who've got co-founders. And I think it's something that's probably worth touching on um, in a little bit more detail than we have previously, because it feels like it's something that's become much more apparent recently that solo founders and the journeys they have can be very different and sort of some of the pro- problems we've seen with both. I mean, I've seen it's something you've seen a lot uh, quite recently as well, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I think both at the the outset, which is obviously where where we kind of touch a founder, um, and then once they're into the execution of the plan, Nairi uh, gets involved and looks at the dynamics. So, yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of research and there's also a lot of anecdotal stuff. You know, people say co-founders are better um, as a team, and I think investors definitely have a bias for co-founders. Um, and I'll go through some of the research around that. But equally, solo founders actually build businesses which um, last longer. So there's, there's an interesting dynamic around that. We can we can talk through that. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think let's draw on some of our practical experience as well, Nairi, about once you're in and working, kind of what the momentum, the velocity, um, and equally you, you start to see the the kind of the characteristics. Um, and the, the the relationship or not between the co-founders and how that works. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, obviously, when usually when we have founders come to us, and especially when it's solo founders, they've had an idea and it's you know it's very much their baby, and then it tend, come, tends to come to like further down the track where either in terms of bandwidth issue, in terms of a breadth of skill set, or actual having the time to be able to do these things that they might want a co-founder how early would you suggest to startups and founders that they might actually want to start looking at for a an actual co-founder yeah i think i think it's 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 critical really isn't it um i guess you know i developed these little phrases in my head so choose a co-founder like you choose a spouse it was, it was kind of my working guide on this in terms of you know you, you've got to be aligned um, with your motives, um, there's got to be personal compatibility. Um, obviously, you've got to be collaborative. So, at the outset, as a solo founder, you may have got all the ideas, and you obviously you've got the passion. You want to drive it yourself. You've got more control. You've got total responsibility. But equally, you've not necessarily got the expertise or the experience, and you certainly won't have the time. I mean, it's an obvious comment, but co-founders have twice the capability in terms of hours in the day um if you look at some of the um kind of classic co-founder relationships there's always a stronger personality um so you look at jobs and wozniak very very complementary skills you know jobs was the visionary he could see the market he could sell wozniak was the the kind of the tech guy um if you look at comedy duos, I think there's something to look at in comedy duos. You look at um, Laurel and Hardy, you know, a straight guy and a funny guy. You look at Reeves and Mortimer, always been two of my favourites. They were just both mad hats. Um, interesting that uh, obviously Bob Mortimer's done it again with Paul Whitehouse in Gone Fishing. But if you go and look at Gone Fishing, um, I think you just look at the chemistry. You look at the camaraderie. You look at the respect, you look at the trust, you look at the love and, and affinity you get between them. And I think that that's important. French and Saunders as well. I, I think just, just look at how they play off each other. And I think that's an invisible part of what makes a, a great co-founder. But to your point, James, um, to answer your question, 
as soon as you recognise you haven't got the skills or expertise to do what you think you want to do, bring somebody else in. You can tell that uh, Ian's got excited about comedy with the recent an- announcement around Faulty Towers coming back. Oh, uh, yeah. With that little uh, yeah. loop around there. But it's quite interesting, especially the founders that we see, because te- obviously we tend to work with tech startups and a lot of people come to us without any tech expertise. I must feel like we almost become that tech co-founder at some, at some stages because often going and finding a CTO or, or having that technical partner is quite hard. And obviously then, the um, like you said, the chemistry can often be quite different between someone who's very business focused and someone who's very technically focused as well. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And, and I think that from our perspective and, and what we do for a living is we're happy to step into that CTO role and obviously bring the, 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 the breadth and depth of experience and ex, um, expertise as a team. But I think one of the lessons we've learned over the last 12 months is to really encourage a solo founder who doesn't have tech chops that they need to bring someone in sooner rather than later. I think Ply Time's a good example where they've done that. Uh, We've helped them do that. And, you know, they've now got CTO who shares the business vision, can add to the product vision. Uh, And Ian and Lisa have been really good at kind of handing over the, the, the reins of that. Whereas some of the others, and I think, you know, you can't shy away from the fact that some of the others that haven't got a co-founder that is tech have not made the progress since we stepped back that they could have done. I think it's not just it's not just co-founder though, is it? It's because you can bring somebody in on a on a smaller equity basis. It could, and I think it goes back to that point around what your strengths are and what are you not so good at, or or what do you not want to do. Um, you know, obviously I'll always talk about marketing, but say, you know, sales is hugely important. If you're quite a reserved um, technical genius, you're probably better in terms of working with the team here or whoever and developing the MVP, but are you going to be the person that wants to pick the phone up and start selling that product? And if not, then, you know, whatever that looks like in terms of building a, a flexible but dynamic team, you know, you probably need to bring somebody in who's going to do that. I think the earlier you can identify where your comfort zone is, where you can take yourself out of a comfort zone, because you have to do that as a founder. But if you know that you're not going to be the right person to sell and you're possibly going to do your product a disservice, then that that's the gap you need to bring in. And it does take a long time, like you're saying, to, to find that right person. They're either somebody you've got a, a previous working relationship with or you've got to perhaps start from scratch. If you start from scratch, you know, it could, t- it could be quite a lengthy process. You need to bring the right person into the business. Yeah, and there's a really good example of that is, is Google. I mean, if you ask most people, they'll say Larry Page and Sergey Brin founded Google. Uh, in actual fact, they had a third founder called Scott Hassan, who actually was kind of the tech lead. He wrote much of the code of the original uh, search engine. Uh, and then Eric Schmidt also joined the business. So it is, and is it, I think the, point, the key point you make is what do you not enjoy doing? What are you not good at? And bring in those skills as soon as possible. Um, you know, Bryn and Page had the vision, but they couldn't write code. You know, so Google emerged from their PhDs, but it was those two other guys that actually gave it the power to turn it into a business. So, yeah, I think it's aligned motives is, is a hard one. Shared vision. I had an experience um a while, a long time ago now, where um, I was asked to become a co-founder and very excited, enjoyed it. And then we started making quite a bit of money. Um, And the other guy um, wanted to take it all out as dividend. And we we had a bit of a hey, lads, hey meeting. And and his vision was, I want a yacht in the south of France. And I wanted to actually spend the money on building a team of 10, 15 people. Um, And that incompatibility well, we just ended it, it finished it there and then, you know. No, I think it's obviously quite, like you say, it's the alignment there of what you actually want to achieve with this startup. Is it something that's going to be, feel, is a lifestyle business? Is it something you want to grow and scale? And like I say, your personal motivation of what you want out of it. Is it the joy of doing it or is it you're looking for that almost cashing? And I suppose that can, a lot of that can, can almost show through some of the messaging as well when you've got two founders where it can almost be quite two different voices. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we would, if it was a co-founder, it's a co-founder scenario, it's definitely something we would unpick, wouldn't we, as part of that 
early yeah. stage process, you know, where what the strengths are. Um, and equally as a solo founder, I think there is, like you say, there can be bigger risks that come with that because essentially you, you it's quite lonely, especially mm. being an early stage entrepreneur. And you do have the support of TSF or which other, other incubator you're with, but when you go home and those thoughts are whirling round at night, you've not got that team to, to bounce stuff off. And I think, you know, mental health and well-being comes into play then around you know work-life balance um and you know it's definitely something we're quite um firm on with our with our startups aren't we around you know having some balance and and i think the other bit is just you know people can become quite resentful of um you know somebody feeling that they're putting more effort into the business than another what are the ways of working how much time are you going to dedicate to that have you got two or three days a week where you're both going to have that that free time because if one person's still working full time but saying I can do that this in the evenings and weekends and the other person's working Monday to Friday probably not going to it's probably not going to work and I think ultimately where co-founders don't work is is once they find that out once they've already started the process and it can be quite expensive and delay time uh, when you're in that process and equally for solo founders to go so far down the path and then need to start looking for a co-founder again, can, can equally kind of waste time. So it's definitely something worth thinking about early on, but, you know, even before the build, if that's if that's the stage you're at. No, that's a good point. There's two, two or three things. Sorry, James. Two or three things I've, I've kind of learned in the last six months. It, it's kind of future skills are more important than your current skills. Um, so while you're actually in that build mode, you're looking at features, you know, the, the, the solo founder is learning alongside us about a tech product, but it's that future skills, you know, as you move from a startup to a scale up, it, it's kind of where's the business going. And, and the other thing I personally learned from the experience I shared with you is that the feedback I got from the, my co-founder was, you're happy to wash the pots, I'm not. And it's that, to your point, Nairi, you know, are they prepared to get stuck in? Mm. Uh, and really kind of, you know, put the hours and, 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 and work in. Um, so learning to trust um, is, is one of those challenges as well. And, and, and like you say, bringing in someone too late, there's loads of traps to fall in around that. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like it works both ways because once you want, if you bring someone on very early, you know, you go through that and it's not, maybe it's someone you don't have as much of a personal relationship with. Yeah. You, know, you go through it, you have that honeymoon phase, everything's great in the norming, storming, performing kind of thing. You get to suddenly, actually, it's a real thing, and the stress call comes on, and then suddenly you start to see a very different side to that person, see where their motivations and how much they're willing to put in is as well. So mm. it really feels like it's almost a Goldilocks moment where, you know, if you, if you are doing it yourself and you've got all the passion and the drive, if you just find someone who suddenly jumps on board and it's almost getting onto the bandwagon, they could yeah. quite quickly jump off. But also trying to so finding the right person at the right time really feels like it's the most like, almost key to what you want to do with a co-founder. I mean, yeah. No, sorry, I was going to say, if somebody jumps off, it's better that they jump off, but you retain your equity though, mm. isn't it? You know, that's the other thing mm. you want to think about, dilution of equity as you start to grow. Mm. Um yeah, and there's, there's ways and mechanics of addressing that, but I think that's a really, it's an emo, obviously it's an emotional as well as a, a financial thing, Nari, and, and to kind of um, maybe ac- accept that you haven't got all the skills is probably a hard thing because you've got the passion. But as, as again, as we've seen, you know, a couple of our solo founders have very quickly built a team um, and that's kind of helped, but they, they still could have gone faster. Um I think if if they'd had a co-founder alongside them, so I think the benefits of being a solo founder are fairly obvious. You know, you're in control, you're making all the decisions. You know, your passion, you're making, you're kind of setting all the priorities. But I think my takeaway really is that lends itself to more of a lifestyle business. Um, if you've got serious growth ambitions, you want to scale, then you need to start thinking about the different pillars. So, like we step in and do the tech, they then need a tech hire. You know, you, you help tremendously on firing up that initial marketing engine, but mm-hmm. again, they need to own that. Um, so I, I think solo founders are nothing wrong with them. And, and like I say, the research shows they they produce businesses that are, are longer term, um, more independent, 
Um, I think a, probably a driver of that is it's harder to get investment. So therefore, you pivot more and you work a little bit harder on making it sustainable. But longer term, um, a co-founder or, or even, you know, having three founders, you know, think about the pillars in any business, you know, sales and marketing, product and finance. You know, you need to create that dream, dream team, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, one question, I'm just going to take the yes, host from <laughs> for a second. Um, one question I had for you, Ian, and it's born out of a couple of conversations we've had recently um, with some people on the exchange programme, actually, in uh, a bonded warehouse in Manchester, which is great, um, is around bringing in or trying to bring somebody in now on an equity-only basis. So if somebody's bootstrapped as far as they can, probably aren't ready for investment yet, you know, um, particularly around tech, what what would your advice be now in terms of you know is it possible to bring somebody in on an equity only basis or how would you go about that particularly for a tech role I suppose? Um, I think it, it's it's very doable. <clears throat> I think it's all about meeting the right person at the right time. You know, <clears throat> I, I flippantly said you know choose a co-founder like a spouse, but you need to get that personal alignment. But I think in in terms of actually bringing in someone down the track. I think it's eminently possible, but you need to be prepared to think about the size of the pie, not your percentage ownership of the pie. You know, you need to be generous with your equity um, because I think that's a a, a sentiment and a gesture from a founder, which is a good message to bringing somebody in. I think it can be done. And then it's the behaviour of the founder, Nairi. Are they prepared to let go and share and give over the responsibility um, I think it's a really attractive proposition, you know, to, to be asked to join a, a solo founder. But obviously, there's a, there's a lot of stuff around um, how the passion works, um, the, the storytelling around the business, that we're, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and it's like in any relationship then, you know, there's a different voice in the room, which I think is powerful mm. because it brings different perspective. Um, you don't just have this blinkered view um, and you can kind of obviously share the responsibility. So it can be done, and, and, and I wouldn't see it as a barrier. You know, you, you do have to be generous with your equity and think about, right, I want to build this business, therefore I can't own 100%. Um, you know, we try and advise our founders in terms of bootstrapping, early seed, first stage investment. Well, you know, the currency there is cash, the currency of bringing in a co-founder down the track is expertise, time and thinking. Uh, and that's really, you know, really valuable. Given a, a startup momentum to get to that um, scaling, you know, maybe there's a hybrid approach. There isn't just one way of doing it. The biggest barrier, I think, is decision making. Um, where you're a solo founder and you're used to calling the shots and it's always been down to you, weighing up the balance of am I prepared to seed control and give it to somebody I don't really know. And that was one of my issues where the friction arose in terms of um, just that sharing of that shared responsibility. But no, I, 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 to your point, I definitely encourage solo founders to have a mindset that says, I'm going to give 10, 20, 30% of the equity away. And you can do that on achieving business milestones. You know, if you're yeah. going to bring in a CTO to you know someone who steps in into one of our startups after we've built... Uh, the MVP, then just put some business milestones for the for this new person to, to kind of earn the equity. You shouldn't just lash it around day one. They've, they've kind of got to earn the right and the trust and, and deliver. But it's the mindset of, yeah, we're building something here. I, I you know, But there are there are founders that want to own 100%, and I've never understood that, to be honest. No, it's like you said, and I know we've said it before to a, lot, a few of our startups, it's, you know, it's how big is the pie? You know, one hundred percent of nothing is still nothing. Yeah. Whereas if, you know, you, whether you know, if you as you go through rounds, you will always dilute. So you're always going to end up with a smaller and smaller slice of said pie. But the bigger it is, the more it's worth. Yeah. So it's always feel like that's always the better approach, and it is just making sure again you bring on the right person. And I think the point you touched on there I really resonated me. Resonated with me was the dividing the roles and responsibilities and being prepared to say this is this is yours and I'm not going to you know try and step into this too much because that is the whole point of you having them there you have to be willing to let go of some of that responsibility yeah one of the I mean Nevo which is one of our very early ventures um 
you know, Mike and Matt as co-founders show a lot of the benefits. You know, I often see them just talking to each other and they're almost operating as sounding boards. You know, Mike know well, they both know the sector, but Mike is passionate about the product. Um, Matt is passionate about customers and customer needs and solving problems. So they're often sounding boards to each other. Um, so you get a much more holistic view as to what the opportunity can be, where the business can go. And let's face it, we all have blind spots. So again, that kind of exchange, and they've got a good rapport and, and they respect each other and, and you know, convincing each other and by logic, they, 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 it works a treat. Um, otherwise, you, you know, you are blinking, I think. Well, thank you. No, really, I think it's really interesting, isn't it? And I think hopefully for people at, at that early stage, it gives them something to to think about in terms of which way to go forward. And for people that are at that crossroads, as well, it gives them some options and, and things to consider. Yeah, because I think I think we always look at when startups come to us if they are solo founders, you know, it doesn't impact too much of our decision making. But we, I know that when co-founders come to us, you know, there's obviously a little bit more there, and in term, terms of their investability, you know, like saying it, they are more investable as as a team than one individual can be because there's two points of failure which I think is something that as much as a solo founder might say might want to retain as much control as possible, there are huge advantages to bringing on that co-founder. So it is something that I think a lot of founders should probably think about. Like we say, it's doing it the earlier, the better. Well, you mentioned the F word there, failure, and I think that's kind of quite important as a consideration. I mean, <clears throat> let's look at Free Up, which is you know going to be one of our stellar uh, ventures. Um, Tom is a single point of failure there, and that is an investor risk. You know, we, we've got people in the team, but um, that that balance. Um, but what Tom has embraced um, with Gabriel, he's he's kind of enabled Gabriel to own the technology, uh, and I think that keeps it fresh. You know, mm. and it kind of you know you work to each other's strengths. So Tom is more about R and D. Can we do this? How do we do this? And then Gabriel makes it happen. So I think, you know, removing the single point of fail is important. There are times, of course, and I've got some experience, I'm not naming names, but you can get co- co-founders then go at each other's throats. Mm-hmm. You know, there are conflicting priorities. They, they can't agree. Um, and, and then you just need to kind of either find a way of, of working together or you go your separate ways. If you're not agreeing on aligned vision and the priorities and there's too much internal conflict, so there are there are times so where it doesn't work, but I think it's very important for us, and we, I think we've given some feedback where in those original scoping sessions in our process, we, we see kind of the founders aren't aligned, and if they're not aligned, that's obviously a huge risk today, and is only going to go wider in the future, isn't it? Very much so, and it's like I say with co-founders, it's very very much that alignment, especially when we see when we're doing scoping sessions, you can see when even when talking about MVPs that, you know, people's ideas begin to diverge. And even if it's not just getting at each other's throats, it's the disagreements that start to step in and there's not been that clearly defined, well, I'm going to look after the product and mm-hmm. I'm going to have the final say on this. And you have, you know, thus in then other parts of the business that will be the other way around where, you know, sometimes like you said, having a third co-founder might be of advantage because you can do it on a majority. But if you've only, if you have got two, if you, I think it is really, Who's where the who the book stops with for various different parts of the business, and then as long as you've got that acceptance, I think that's when we find teams are the strongest because they can have conflict but do it in a healthy way, and they already know that there's a resolution. Yeah, I mean, Facebook's a good story around this. If you if you look at the history of Facebook, you know Zuckerberg founded it, um, <clears throat> but he had some co-founders. He burnt them all out uh, as an individual. He he literally people just left. And Facebook lost its way. And it wasn't until Sheryl Sandberg actually came on board with a different skill set, different experience that that then took off. So, I, I, again, you know, I, I wouldn't suggest that she ever, <coughs> excuse me, sees herself as a co founder. But it, it is that kind of burnout and the mentality. And, you, you know, you, at the outset, you should be thinking, I want to scale this business. What's the, what's the skill set? What's the team? What key people do I need around me? to build this business um so scaling i think day one excuse me 
should drive you to be thinking about co-founders? I mean, I think we've covered off quite a lot there for people to digest in sort of 25 minutes. So as always, we'll close it out with, you know, if there's one piece of advice in out of all the uh, stuff you said there, that one small takeaway, what would it, what would it be? Um, you can't do everything. You've not got the skills or experience to do everything. Often a founder is not the person to kind of lead the business. You know, founder has the idea, their innovation mindset, they're in discovery, but they're not someone who then cranks the wheel to build a commercial vehicle. Um, equally, I, I would ad- advocate you need a CTO if you are a tech product startup, but don't let that lack of experience in yourself stop you from having that ambition, but look to hire the skills that you need and do it sooner rather than later, James. Mary? I think just um, what we talked about value, I think values and me, making sure that, um, you know, you can bring in freelance consultancy resource, you know, you can use platforms like Fiverr to plug some gaps, but essentially the person that you sat opposite the table with, you've got to be able to, you probably spend more time with them than you would with your spouse. So you've got to share those values and, <laughs> and you know, iron out some of those difficulties. And like you said, know when to pull the plug. Um, you, you are going to drive each other mad because you're going to be sat together 12, 14 hours a day some days. Um, and, you know, a bit of conflict is healthy in a debate. But Absolutely. when it starts to become toxic, you know, quickly when you pull because it will just affect the business. I think for me, it's very much the the roles and responsibilities. Know what, understand yourself, know what you're not good at. So if you're going to look for a co-founder, Look at what you're going to what what skills you're bringing in, what sort of personality, like Mary, like you said, with the um, you know values and what you want from this. At the end of the day, because if you don't want the same thing and you pull in different directions, it's never going to work. Yeah, which is why I often ask, you know, what does success look like? Because I was staggered um, eighteen months into my relationship. You know, the, the phrase "I want a yacht in the south of France." Let's spend the money taking the money out of the business, when I say, no, we can hire 10 people, that lack of alignment just came, and within within four weeks I'd left them, it was over. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's, if you're not aligned, you're never going to get anywhere, no matter how, if you've got the most complementary skill sets in the world, you have to you have people in the same direction. You know, it's what makes the boat go faster at the end of the day. Yeah. But yeah. no, I think that's, uh, we've covered a lot in half an hour there. So again, yeah. thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much, Larry. I think we've got an say, event coming yeah, up, don't forget the webinar. So we are running a webinar on co-founders versus solo founders. Uh, it makes it sound like a fight, doesn't it? Yeah. Or something. The benefits of co- being a co-founder uh, as opposed to solo founder and vice versa. Um, so we'll pop the link for the registration um, in the box below. Um, and hopefully people, if they're interested, can sign up and find yep. out a little bit more. Yep, and all the webinars will be on our uh, YouTube channel as well. So yep. if uh, you ever want, if you can't make it, while it's live, Don't you know, worry. just catch it afterwards. Real. Well, no, Good. thank you very much, Larry. Thank you. Thank you much, Larry. Ian. Ian, and we'll hopefully catch all our listeners on the next one. Yeah, take care. Thanks. Bye. I think that just about wraps things up here. If you have any thoughts or questions on anything we said today, get in touch, whether that be through our Twitter at RealTSF or email at hello at startupfactory.tech or feel free to drop in for a coffee and a chat. As ever, thanks for listening.